Good morning. In the 1999 movie, The Matrix, its main hero, Neo, learns that the world he considered real is an illusion. There's a different reality beyond the one he directly experiences, a reality that is more powerful and freeing than anything he knows. Yet, it is a reality that one needs to choose to see, one that needs to be discovered continually. The basic idea of the matrix is not dissimilar from the world portrayed in the Bible. According to the biblical worldview, God's kingdom interlocks and interrupts our kingdom, our system, our way of life. It is invisible, yet more real. It is untouchable, yet more solid. It is a parallel universe to the world as we know it and live it. It challenges us to walk according to a different drumbeat. It seems to me that our Old Testament reading from 1 Samuel and Jesus' parables speak about the same, about the characteristics of the kingdom. Let us begin with the charming story about Samuel who looks for a new king among, among the sons of Jesse from Bethlehem. This story comes on the heels of the rejection of Saul in 1 Samuel 15. God, through Samuel, rejected Saul as king over Israel. And Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord was sorry that he made Saul king. That's the end of chapter 15. Yet the Lord's remorse is apparently more short-lived than that of Samuel. God is forward-looking, already seeking the next monarch. And therefore, he admonishes Samuel, the prophet, to go over his feelings for Saul and go to Bethlehem to anoint another person. The text literally says, For I have seen among the sons of Jesse a king. I have seen among the sons of Jesse, a king. God sees ordinary boys in one family, living in one rural area, and among them he sees somebody who is, in fact, somebody different, a king already. So Samuel goes and pretends to organize a sacrificial feast, and he invites Jesse and his sons to come and participate. As soon as the oldest, Eliab, appears on the scene, Samuel, Samuel knows. This is the Lord's anointed. Although he was explicitly told to wait for God's further directions, he doesn't need that. Because the answer to this riddle of who the next king will be is obvious to him. An apparently tall, muscular, and eldest, and therefore the most experienced, Eliab, is a natural choice for a military leader. And kings at that time, they were military leaders. Yet Samuel is wrong. I have rejected him, says the Lord. God's kingdom is different from the kingdom according to human criteria. Eliab looks like Saul, a tall, handsome person who is an expected choice for a leader. Yet the experiment with Saul failed. God's kingdom cannot be brought into existence according to human rules. By choosing Eliab, Samuel would select the same kind of ruler, the same kind of principle, the same style, the style that was already rejected by God. For the Lord does not see as humans see, God says. They look on the outward appearance, 
but the Lord sees the heart. Samuel's mistake in Bethlehem is a shocking example that even the seer does not see how God sees. Even the seer doesn't see the way God sees. Samuel, and with him all humans, naturally sees with eyes, with our eyes, what is visible. But God sees with the heart what is invisible yet more foundational. Eliab, like Saul, is a natural leader. David, who is not invited to the party by his own family, is someone people would not even consider. He is, as his father says, the youngest. The word that can be translated also differently and is throughout the Old Testament, sometimes as the youngest or the smallest or the insignificant or the least. God chooses the least to accomplish much. God chooses the smallest to make his kingdom grow. This is how I understand the image of the heart functioning here. Here Here and in other places, David is called a man according to God's heart, which is often taken to relate to David's moral superiority, especially when compared to Saul. Yet David has his own set of troubling incidents. And Saul, on the other hand, is not without positive moments. Rather, I think that the statement about the heart seems to say something about God's way of building his kingdom. David is that beginning that reflects God's upside-down priorities. He is the insignificant one. He is the forgotten one, even by his family. The small one is favored because that does not overshadow God's involvement in the process. He represents a principle at work when God puts things in motion. Therefore, when we, perhaps trying to find a solution to a problem in our business or our church, come to an obvious answer, maybe we should venture a step further. Is this an answer that reflects the otherworldly nature of God's kingdom? Have we looked deeper? Or when we want to hire somebody for a certain position and the person ticks all the boxes, it's a natural choice. Shouldn't we at least pause? Is this the best person based on kingdom values? David is not humanly unattractive. When he appears on the scene, he's actually quite beautiful. He's handsome. Yet he's not the first choice. On the first sight, he is the insignificant one. This is the same principle as the one brought forward by Jesus' two parables about a seed. The mustard seed fits well Jesus' idea because it begins like a small seed, but then it grows into a large bush with branches that creates shade. It testifies to God's preference to reverse human expectations, which is something not innate to anybody, not even the seers. And thankfully, as the parable of the growing seed shows, this kingdom grows independently of us, and sometimes in spite of us. So this leads me to tell you a story, and from now until the end of my sermon, I'm just going to tell a long story. A story in which I do not look very good. It all started with my tendency, probably tamed now by years living in a different country, to startle people or to play jokes on people. The event which I'm about to describe uh, took place several years ago when I was a pastor in a beautiful underground church in Bratislava, Slovakia. At that time, we decided to preach a series on of sermons on Jesus' parables, and we likened them, like I did before the sermon, to riddles. The parables are like riddles, and maybe speaking about it will help us 
to make them more uh, comprehensive today, comprehensible today. I was asked to preach the opening sermon that combined both lectionary readings that fall on this Sunday and the previous Sunday. So it's a long section from Mark 3 and 4. But I thought, it's not enough just to say that parables are riddles. I should create a riddle that people can guess, trying to figure out what's happening. So I organized the following happening. I volunteered to do the Bible reading before the sermon as well. The first text, which was clearly marked for the people to see, so they knew what's going to be read, depicted the incident about which Christina preached last week, the enmity or distance between Jesus and his own biological family. The passage challenges the notion of who is in and who is out. Although Jesus' family should belong to those who are in, they are, in fact, in the story outside of the house in which Jesus preaches. And those who are in are foreigners who hear God's word. I stood by the pulpit and began reading these words. Then his mother and his brothers come. At that moment, a person who normally greeted people by the door ran into the sanctuary and shouted, Joseph, I'm sorry to interrupt, but your parents are standing outside and they want to talk to you. This was a serious person, not known for joking. And it was a believable incident. My family lived in a different country, but they came to visit me time to time. So this was a rare, but a believable situation. I paused and told the man, we just started a worship service here. Please ask them to come in. No, they don't want to come in, the man said. They want you to come outside. So I said, they don't want to come in? So let them stay outside, and I'll talk to them after the service is over. I must say that I misjudged the impact of the scenario and the words on the people. Jesus' words sound harsh by themselves, now with the added emphasis of a real-life performance, the congregants were outraged. These normally polite and reserved people started to shout, Go talk to your parents! Or, let's sing a song and you deal with your personal issues. <laughs> One person, respected by almost everybody, stood up and addressed the congregation. You carry on here, and I'll go outside, find the parents, and deal with it. So we did. We kept going. The man came back after a few minutes when we were singing a song. He sat next to me and said, well done, you got almost everybody. Then the second reading came. The one about a lamp that should be, pent, uh, should be put on the table, not under the table, so that it shines in the room. When I was about to read this section, a girl came to the altar carrying a lit candle. I was interrupted again. I said, what's happening? And she said, we forgot to decorate the church with candles. I'm sorry. And she put the candle down under the table. I said, well, since you're here, put it on the table so that everybody can see it. This scene was a little too improbable, a little too overplayed on purpose. So people felt, yeah, something is going on here. And I could see they were trying to figure out well, what all this acting means. That was that riddle I was trying to create. When the service was over, I didn't explain much, even when I was greeted people when they were leaving. And I couldn't even. Many were still upset about me. They said, and you should be an example to our children? I used to like you. It is part of my nature to play the game till the end. 
because this was just the first service. We also had second service in the evening. And I did the same thing. Again, a respected man went inside and said that my parents are outside. Another respectable person ran outside looking for them. We had a girl who brought a candle, and then the candle ended up on the table. This was a smaller gathering. The atmosphere was more, more intimate, contemplative. The people, most of them at least, seemed to get the pun, and I was happy. I thought the Spirit was moving powerfully through the church, and I kept preaching, going off the script, feeling energized and inspired. God was doing something big that day. At that very point, I think, God felt that this light-hearted minister played a bit too much with his precious bride and decided to play with me. Suddenly, in the middle of my sermon, I think, a man started to walk down the steps of the church. The church was in the basement, so to get in, you had to walk down the stairs um, between the pews. His was an unusual sight. He was short but sturdy, wearing a heavy black coat covering not only his body but also his legs. Long, white hair and thick, thick white beard dominated his face. A black, wide-brimmed hat was on his head. He looked like a man from the past or from a different culture, and all eyes were on him. Nobody paid attention to me anymore, but I kept preaching. I didn't want to be interrupted. I was on fire, and I was hoping that he would sit down in the seventh row or the sixth or the fifth or the fourth. Surely he will sit down in the first row, but he didn't. He came up right to me, knelt in front of the altar, and started to pray out loud in Hebrew. I had to stop. I said, how can we help you? And he replied with a strong voice, I am a Jewish rabbi. And I came here to pray. And then I recognized him. He was a man who partly lived on the street. And when he drank too much, he started to think that he is a Jewish rabbi. At that moment, you never knew what he could do. I needed help. I looked around, my eyes seeking a minimal, at least a minimal support from the people. But all I got was... Well played. I was on my own. So I said, in this part of the service, we are hearing God's word. We will pray a little later. Would you be willing to sit down in the first row? I'll join you in a minute. To my surprise, the man listened to me. He stood up, turned around, went to the first row and sat down. I was confused. This was certainly nothing planned, yet I was the only one who knew it. I had to compose myself, so I went back to my written manuscript just to follow what is there so that I can finish the sermon. And my eyes fell on my prepared words fitting the situation. My words said, In God's kingdom... The insiders often end up on the outside, and unexpected individuals appear in the center. For the people in the sanctuary, what they saw and what they heard felt like a well-prepared play. For me, this was a powerful surprise. The man who came unknowingly was a sign of of the kingdom, of God's reversal of things. He was visibly in the center, 
praying in Hebrew, expressing with his unusual attire that God works differently that, than what we expect. I finished my talk rather quickly. I was ashamed. I sat down next to him uh, and put my arm around his shoulders and I said, what do you need? And he said in a desperate voice, I'm really hungry. So I said, wait with me here. After the service is over, I'll make something for you. And so we sat next to each other, singing the last couple of songs with enthusiasm and joy. The scene remains imprinted on my mind. After the service, when he ate his soup, we talked. He was a bit confused, but he was sincere. Maybe more sincere than us, the regulars who faithfully attend the church every Sunday. For me, this is a palpable reminder that my view of, of God's kingdom is still too domesticated. Too predictable. God's ways are different. The heavenly kingdom surprises us, even those who should have eyes to see. David was not the expected choice. He was the unexpected individual who, against all the odds, appeared in the center. The size of a mustard seed does not seem to rise high hopes. Stories like these from the Bible and from our own life are signs of a different reality beyond the world we see. Like Neo, we need to be awakened to it. We need to seek it. We need to bring it to life for us and for others. May God help us to do so. Amen.